All right, well, we were really hyping up the U.S. inflation numbers. We thought it could be hugely market moving. And in the end, uh, markets are basically flat, a little mildly lower when you take a look at the NASDAQ. That's just because... Uh, a, we had a rally going into the numbers. B, they came exactly in line with expectations, so no better, no worse. Uh, and C, as I mentioned, there was kind of something to chew on for everybody to spending, uh, depending on what your perspective uh, was. There are some asset classes, though, that are decidedly uh, making a move. Uh, you take a look at the U.S. dollar, for example. That is under pressure right now. That's putting a bit of a, a fire under commodities, specifically gold. Let's bring in Martin Pelletier, Senior Portfolio Manager at TriBest Wealth Council, to help us unpack this. I don't know, uh, is there a chance we can make inflation boring again uh, and we don't have to, uh, you know, get excited or hyper about every reading, every reading like the old days? I don't know. I mean, one can always hope. I mean, the, the, pro the problem is, is that, you know, we have a market that's dominated by traders that have only known quantitative easing and loose monetary policy and inflation being below 2%. And so, you know, very few are, are actually can realize that, hey, we can have inflation that is above 2% and, uh, and interest rates that are um, above zero. <laughs> and so what does that mean from an investing standpoint? And so, you know, we're, we're just keep anchoring saying we're going to go back and, and we want to own those, sec those segments of the market that's going to benefit when it does go back and, and what happens if it doesn't. And what happens then? What's your answer? Well, you know, the, the big the big question is is to to you know take a look at at previous cycles that that we did have some inflationary pressure, um, and and going post World War II is is one of them, for example, uh, where we had a, a major disruption to to economies, not unlike the the COVID situation and the lockdowns, and so. You know, in, in our opinion, looking at uh, look at the rabbit versus the hare type of scenario, um, or sorry, the, the rabbit versus the turtle uh, scenario, where uh, slow and steady is going to win the race in this kind of a market environment. So that means good old fashioned value uh, companies that can can generate dividends growth in a uh, economy that's still you know fairly strong and tight labor market but with uh, a higher uh, cost of capital. And that means the growth stories will, will be struggling and uh, not, uh, not, not outperforming like they did the last decade or so. And, and what screens as value for you these days? Because sometimes the definition can change. Uh, I would say, you know, you look at some tech names, they could potentially uh, be value stocks. Absolutely. So what I mean by value is companies that can generate cash flow uh, in an in interest rate environment that's four to five percent, and so there are companies in the tech space that can do that, like Microsoft, for example, uh, maybe even um, Amazon or uh, or Google. Um, and there are those in the tech space that can't that that really need that low cost of capital to deploy a, a, a rapidly grow uh, growth model uh, into their business plan. Um, other areas that we like are uh, financial services can still make money in, in this kind of environment. You look at the spreads, uh, you look at, uh, you know, the GIC rates uh, longer term versus longer term treasuries. There's a gap there. So there's some nice spreads that uh, uh, the banks are making. Uh, there's also energy that I've been talking about. Um, your, your, you know, there, and commodities. You just mentioned that U.S. dollars dropping. We think that's going to continue to be a theme. And that will benefit commodities uh, producers, especially up here in Canada. Uh, we get a revenue stream in, in in energy producers get a revenue stream in U.S. dollars, and their cost bases in Canadian dollars. So there's a, a potential trade there as well. Let's spend a beat first before we go. To, I will unpack the U.S. dollar, but because you mentioned Canadian banks, they're up from the October lows, just like the U.S. banks are, though not uh, to the same magnitude. And there's a question about how can you own banks into an economic slowdown? Uh, what's your answer to that? Well, the the Canadian banks are a little different than U.S. banks. Uh, in, we are operating within an oligopoly type of, of, of environment with large protective moats. And so uh, there's a lot, maybe some more predictability around that. In regards to an economic slowdown uh, in, in Canada, um, for example, yeah, I think there's probably more of, a, of an economic risk to the Canadian economy than the U.S. economy, but the Canadian banks are buffeted a little bit. Looking at mortgage exposure, 
um, and some of the risks there. A lot of that's been offloaded to the Canadian government via CMHC. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at the Canadian banks. I think we're probably, you know, you've got some really nice dividend yields there. Um, probably not a, a huge amount of capital appreciation. Um, but if you look at the dividend yields and a little bit of growth, you get to 8%. Um, that's a that's a pretty good rate of return, um, e, e, even in this inflation environment that is starting to improve. If you get a two percent spread, and I think inflation will probably fall back down to, you know, four percent. Um, and you know, if you get seven eight percent uh, target return on, on, on the on the financials, then you're ahead. Uh, let's talk about that U.S. dollar because the the move there is pretty decisive. It's off about 10 percent from the peak, now hitting the lowest level uh, since the summer. Do you think that trend continues? And if so, what are the implications for Canadian investors? Um, great question. I, I I wrote a piece on this in in my post column this week. And I took a look back at 2000 through to 2008. You have to believe that there's a structural shift in the market, and and that that's you know, the the view that we're taking. Um, you you had a, a major event um, that caused excess fiscal spending that isn't being curtailed that we think will result in higher interest rates for longer. And in that kind of environment, it wouldn't be unlike what transpired post the, the 2000 uh, tech rollover. And, in, and from 2000 through to 2008, you had uh, the S&P 500 that was flat. Um, I'm, not think, I'm not saying you know, that's going to be the case going forward. Certainly, as, as you had asked earlier, there are components of the S&P within the tech space um, that are, are generating strong cash flow, um, albeit um, we think that there is going to be outperformance in uh, the Canadian dollar versus the U.S. dollar and if that environment does continue to, if it does repeat itself. And so going back to, to my example, the U.S. dollar fell 30 percent um, against uh, a basket of global currencies and the Canadian dollar did really well. And so we're, maybe it doesn't go to that kind of extreme, but we are repatriating some of our dollars back mm -hmm. and we're owning the U.S. Uh, equity market as a CAD hedged approach and some, some ETFs you can use to do that. What are they? Uh, there's the VSP or the XSP are, uh, are, are two of the cat hedge, big well-known Canadian uh, cat hedged uh, ETFs and, uh, and, and, and you know, they'll, they'll allow you to own the US market and hedge out the, the falling dollar. Oh, looks like you're getting a <laughs> Oh, that's, uh, it looked like you were getting um, a phone call, but I think we were having some technical uh, issues there. Uh, just to reiterate for our viewers, the ETFs you were talking about, the VSP, Victor, Sam, Paul, and the XSP uh, ETF.